The RSA-1, part of South Africa's ambitious RSA series of rocket and missile projects developed during the late 20th century, represents a complex and often misunderstood chapter in the nation's technological and strategic history. Conceived in an era of political isolation and driven by the need for autonomous defense and space capabilities, RSA-1 combined indigenous engineering with imported concepts to produce a vehicle that blurred lines between tactical ballistic systems and space launch architectures. The program was an expression of national determination to master high-end rocketry despite sanctions, limited access to specialized components, and a small industrial base, and it required creative systems engineering, cross-disciplinary collaboration, and significant iteration. At its core the RSA-1 reflected a pragmatic approach, use modular design where possible, rely on proven propulsion cycles adapted to locally available propellants and materials, and emphasize a mobile launcher concept that reduced the vulnerability of fixed facilities and increased operational flexibility. These priorities shape the vehicle's overall geometry, support equipment, and operational doctrine. The nose section housed a guidance suite that, for the era, represented a notable engineering accomplishment, inertial navigation complemented by ground-aided updates during long-range flights, and an avionics bay designed for harsh launch and transit environments. Thermal management and structural reinforcement were concentrated where ascent heating and acoustic loads were highest, and designers adopted redundant systems in critical areas to improve reliability in the field. Propulsion solutions favored a solid first stage for simplicity, storability, and rapid reaction, often paired with a liquid or specially formulated solid upper stage when orbital insertion or finer velocity control was required. This hybrid approach sought to balance the logistical advantages of solid motors with the controllability of liquid propulsion for terminal maneuvers or orbital injection. The mobile launch concept drove additional design constraints, quick erect and launch sequences, secure electrical and fluid hookups compatible with dispersed basing, and ruggedized interfaces for transportation over rough roads. These operational requirements impacted not only the vehicle but also the ground support equipment, fueling procedures, and crew training, resulting in a system that was more than a rocket, it was an integrated operational package. Within South Africa the RSA-1 program stimulated downstream capabilities well beyond the missile itself. Metallurgy, guidance electronics, manufacturing tolerances, and test instrumentation all advanced through the program's demands, and engineers trained on RSA projects later contributed to civilian aerospace, satellite programs, and exportable defense products. The knowledge transfer from research to production lines was significant. Materials treatments for heat resistance, precision machining for thrust chamber components, and vibration-hardened electronics were all areas where the program left a durable legacy. Internationally the RSA-1 drew scrutiny because of the dual-use nature of ballistic and space launch technologies. Although South African authorities emphasized peaceful applications, satellite launch and scientific research, the possibility of rapid adaptation to military strike roles could not be ignored by regional neighbors or policy makers elsewhere, producing diplomatic tensions and contributing to broader conversations about arms control and confidence-building measures. The program therefore sat at the intersection of technical ingenuity and geopolitical sensitivity, illustrating how advanced engineering projects can shape perceptions of national intent as much as they alter military capability. Technically, the RSA-1 confronted many familiar rocket engineering problems at a scale and under constraints that made elegant problem-solving essential. Aerothermal heating during ascent demanded careful selection of ablation-resistant materials and specific attention to nose cone shaping to minimize peak heat loads, vibration and acoustic energy required isolation mounts for delicate avionics, and propellant chemistry choices influenced storage, fueling safety, and launch readiness timelines. Designers invested in robust ground handling systems, quick disconnects, armored transport cradles, and checklists that emphasized crew safety, because the operational concept prioritized dispersed basing and reduced susceptibility to preemptive strikes. Guidance and control systems were built around a pragmatic redundancy philosophy, multiple sensors, fault-tolerant software, and the ability to accept ground-based midcourse updates improved mission assurance while preserving the capacity for autonomous flight in denied communications environments. The testing program for RSA-1 was necessarily rigorous and incremental, progressing from static fire tests and component-level qualification through captive carry trials and finally full-scale launches from controlled ranges. Each test provided data that recalibrated models for structural loads, 
Plume interactions with launch rails are canisters, and thermal gradients across composite sections. These empirical insights gradually matured prototype designs into vehicles that demonstrated consistent performance characteristics, even if the program never achieved the scale or public profile of superpower programs of the same era. The program's life cycle also reflected the changing strategic and political context. As domestic politics evolved and international engagement increased, priorities shifted from clandestine development under sanctions to transparent cooperation and non-proliferation commitments. This transition influenced resource allocation, export considerations, and the decision to emphasize clearly civilian applications where possible. In practice that meant leveraging RSA-derived technologies into legitimate space launch services and defense products that could be marketed with fewer diplomatic constraints. From an industrial perspective the RSA-1 era showed how capability development can be a force multiplier. A relatively focused rocket program catalyzed advances across suppliers, system integrators, and testing infrastructure, creating a clustered capability that outlived any single vehicle design. For engineers and historians alike RSA-1 offers instructive lessons about trade-offs, mobility versus complexity, rapid reaction versus sustainment, and indigenous production versus selective importation. It also underscores how technical programs are inseparable from the societies that produce them. Economic resources, political will, and institutional knowledge all determine whether an ambitious design becomes an enduring capability. In retrospective assessments, RSA-1 rarely appears as a story of spectacular breakthroughs so much as a narrative of adaptive engineering and strategic pragmatism. Under constraints it managed to deliver a credible demonstration of long-range rocket and launcher technologies, to train a cohort of specialists, and to leave behind a set of manufacturing and testing practices that benefited subsequent civilian and defense programs. Whether evaluated through the lens of deterrence, scientific progress, or industrial policy, RSA-1 stands as a reminder that advanced aerospace achievements are rarely the product of single genius moments, rather they emerge from sustained institutional effort, iterative problem-solving, and the steady accumulation of technical know-how.